Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, The Times They Are A-Changing, How Stacks for Books Are Transforming Into Spaces for Makers, which is sponsored by ProQuest. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you should be able to follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you will see a chat panel. Uh, please feel free to use this to submit questions or comments. At the end of the presentation, we will take a few minutes to answer your questions, so please feel free to submit them throughout. If you lose audio or would like to change how you're connected to it, look under the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen and click on the phone question mark icon. Please also note that today's program is being recorded and all registrants will receive follow-up instructions on how to access the archived version. And now, I'm very pleased to introduce Gina McHugh, Tess Santoro, and Mark McAllen. Gina is the Director of eBook Sales for North America at ProQuest. She worked at Silver Platter and Ovid in both sales and marketing of their academic, clinical, and content solutions. In 2003, she started with eBrary as one of two salespeople in the organization and watched the company grow over the years and expand through the acquisition by ProQuest. She has held various roles in sales, domestic and global, for the organization. The focus of her career has been on research tools and working with best-in-class solutions for libraries. Tess Santoro oversees circulation, reference, and instruction for the Dobbs Ferry campus. Tess has been instrumental in completing the transformation of the library learning commons into a 24-7 virtual library with the addition of e-books, e-journals, and e-reference. She received a campus microgrant to develop 3D printing initiatives within the college curriculum. She also coordinates and teaches library instruction sessions for the general education and humanities courses and is very involved in the library's information literacy program and its assessment. Mark McAllen is Associate Dean for Library Information Services at Abilene Christian University. His research interests include library history and library administration. He's been involved in numerous renovations of spaces in the library at Abilene Christian University including ACU's Learning Commons in 2005 and the AT&T Learning Studio in 2010. Mark is an avid fan of the maker movement and has supported ACU's efforts in creating the Maker Lab through staffing and special programs. At this point, we are ready to get started, so I will turn the floor over to Gina. Okay, great. Thank you. And Mark, if you could let me know if uh, you're able to hear me. I had to switch audio. Um, is everything okay? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay, perfect. Hi, uh, thank you uh, for the time this afternoon. I'm Gina McHugh with uh, ProQuest. And I have uh, I get the opportunity to talk about some of the things we've been working on with libraries over the past few years. And one of the, the um, artifacts of that has been this survey where we talked to over 300 libraries, primarily libraries in academia in the United States, and we talked to them about what they're doing with space reclamation, how they're addressing it within their institution, why they're doing space reclamation projects, and we got a series of uh, information back and it's been really exciting for us to see how libraries are reinventing their spaces and what they're working on. So it's over 300 libraries that we did talk to. Uh, most of them were in the United States for this particular exercise. And when you see the, um, I'm going to talk about a few other statistics during my portion, but you see a couple uh, statistics, hopefully <laughs> my, my PowerPoint is progressing. Uh, but You'll see a few statistics on there, and I want you to think, you know, does this resonate with me and in, in my library? Is this, uh, you know, some of the reasons that we've been looking at space reclamation? Um, are we looking at the maker space, uh, maker space for our organization? Or were there other reasons that we were looking at uh, making changes within our library? So uh, you see that 74% of libraries are doing some form of space reclamation either now they're looking at doing it in the future, 
or they might be very heavy in it right now. So we're starting to see a lot of libraries analyzing their collections, looking at circulation stats, looking at their acquisition strategies going forward, both from a print and an electronic standpoint, and asking us questions now as an, as an ebook aggregator about how do, we, uh, how do we combine our print and electronic? Can we bundle it at the time of purchase? How do we look at our circulation stats and how can you help us do that? So I spent a lot of times with libraries looking at that and seeing, um, and seeing what's happen happening with their collections. One other stat that's not on the screen is uh, we asked uh, libraries within this uh, survey of what percent of their print book budgets have shifted to e-book budgets completely or mostly as a result of their space reclamation programs. And over 50%, so 51% were saying that they're, they're making a complete change to their acquisition strategy. We asked other uh, libraries about weeding and, and different reasons why they're weeding their collections. So we asked what percent are weeding print titles and offering eBooks instead. And as probably most of you would say, it's, it's, that's a high number, 73% said that they were doing that. And then we sit down with libraries and talk about the value of an e-collection coupled with the investment you've already made in the print, how that relates to off-site storage, what are the storage costs, how can we collaborate with our sister libraries, either within our consortium uh, or with a, you know, a bigger uh, group of consortia? And, uh, and, and how much time are we spending at our library on hours of staff time pouring over that data? And what does that you know, mean to our staff and, and having to look at that? Um, and uh, for duplication, we asked a, a question of libraries in that uh, survey again of what percent are duplicating high circulating books, so books that have gotten high usage in print in electronic format. And that's, um, and only 23% said that they were looking at highly circulating titles. But uh, I've spent probably the last year looking and working with libraries on matching titles that we have available, coupled with high circulation of titles on their shelves, and really talking to publishers about how we can get you the right price for that. You've already made the investment in a, in a print title. How do we get uh, the access for that and make that book available? Like they did with the journals many, many years ago when I was back at, at Ovid and, and Silver Platter. So we have, uh, libraries are starting to look at that, looking at highly circulating titles. How, aside from the cool things like maker spaces and, 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 and putting that together, but how do we best allow for discovery of our high circulating titles by offering an e-version so students can discover it and then find it on the shelf or it's not available because it's highly circulating. So we look at that as well. So 23% of libraries are starting to dab their toe in that. And then the thing that, that's most exciting to me right now is looking at um, libraries that are creating hacker and, and maker spaces within their organizations. And 35% uh, are, are reclaiming space for those activities. So it's been a really neat uh, process in looking at that. You know, it used to be the coffee shops or it used to be the science library now needs to merge into the main library and we're losing space among the campus. But now we've really been looking at uh, reinventing spaces for students to have uh, access to, to uh, new technology. Uh, I'm from Boston, so we've worked with, on a number of projects uh, it, in and among the state of uh, Massachusetts, among, among other places uh, across the country and, and really the world on, the, on these spaces. Northeastern's looking at a very big project for that. Um, MIT, of course, has a wonderful uh, maker space within their organization. Liberty University in Virginia does as well. So we've been looking at those. And what we do at ProQuest is we help um, libraries analyze their collections and the volumes uh, and we match them to what's available uh, through taking advantage of Oasis, taking advantage of books and print, and then we have a very cleverly named product called Titles Matching Fast, and we take this Titles Matching Fast and we match it to show you what might be available and affordable for your libraries to be able to create that space to do something new for your students. So. Um, for us, we were able to do that. We look at your highly used titles. We match them against highly used titles at ProQuest, so we can kind of give you a, a good housekeeping seal of approval that not only are these titles highly circulating in your library, so you might want to reinvest in them in, in electronic, 
if you need to create the space. But they're all also highly used titles across the global audience at ProQuest, uh, you know, to kind of like the other libraries are finding this useful, we hope you do as well. So um, that's been uh, quite a focus of us uh, in, in what we've been doing at, at the organization. We've gotten wonderful feedback for what libraries are doing across uh, in North America in, in academic libraries and how they're creating new spaces or just uh, weeding collections and making access available for online students. So we have a lot of data and a lot of kind of sweat, labor, and looking through these collections and trying to save you all um, some of the time on that and using our, our tools and services that, that we have available to, to uh, create those uh, lists for you and be able to look at what that might look like. So not to, uh, I would like to, because we get to hear the cool things libraries are doing with that, I'm going to turn it over at this point to, to Tess, who is going to talk to us about what they've been doing at Mercy College uh, and in, in creating that type of space. So I'll turn it over to her, and then at the end, if there are any questions on what we're doing at ProQuest, I'd be happy to answer those. So thank you, thank you all for your time. Let me turn. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I really appreciate uh, ACRL and ProQuest giving me the opportunity to talk about our, um, our maker lab here at Abilene Christian University. Uh, this is going to be a very familiar logo on our campus. Uh, we've gotten a lot of interest in our maker lab here at ACU. It is uh, pretty much the talk of all the students that they come to visit our campus. Um, every tour that comes to visit our campus uh, of parents or, or, or prospective students uh, make a visit to our maker lab and, uh, and our um, faculty and staff are also uh, very uh, excited about uh, what we've done with it. Um, I just really like this quote. I'm currently reading um, Renee Brown's book, Rising Strong, and in her book she has a lot of uh, great, um, great quotes about creativity and and, um, and making and kind of the connection between that and knowledge. And I really like this quote because of its connection uh, with the knowledge that students gain from our resources that we have in the library. And then putting that knowledge into practice through the creative works like we're seeing uh, in the maker movement. So what is our Maker Lab that we've got here? Our Maker Lab is really focused on three areas here. Our um, so first of all, it's about making things. Um, we all like to make something, whether it be from Legos to cooking, or we're all hardwired to solve some kind of problem. And so here in the Maker Lab, we're, um, we believe in making as a pedagogical tool. Uh, the building something informs us about the process in a different way. Um, that we can use our um, that we can use the processes and tools to make something. And the wonderful thing about the Maker Lab is the idea of failing fast and often. That's not something you usually get to do um, with, you know, with your traditional research papers or other things that we do in the library. You know, you work on a project, you turn it into your professor, and you know, you get a you get a grade on it. It's, uh, you have the opportunity to to pass or fail on that but you don't really get a chance to, to try again. And the wonderful thing about the Maker Lab is that the whole philosophy behind this is the idea of failing fast and often. And so from those, that, from those failures, you learn a lot of great lessons that you can use uh, to, uh, in action to solve your problems or, solve, or toward a goal that you're trying to reach. Uh, so for instance, our, just this past week, we had all of our, um, freshmen that are in our um, freshman experience course called Cornerstone come in and they were, uh, did a great exercise where they had to build a tower out of, uh, out of construction paper and a ping pong ball and then uh, who could build the tallest tower in that. And so it was wonderful to see these freshmen come together and work together in groups to, uh, to build those towers. And like I said, it was just, a, it was, um, it was just paper and, uh, and a ping pong ball, but you could see the, the interaction and, and the learning that took place there was fantastic. And then finally, uh, sharing. So inventive, inventive solutions that often emerge from, uh, from, the, 
come out of our out of the work that we do in the Maker Lab, and we provide traditional and specialized tools and materials to enable the mixing of people with ideas. And uh, and the wonderful thing out of that is you have these you have these wonderful outcomes of that that allow you to show your projects or your contraptions or whatever you're making. And it really does inspire others to come along and, and behind you and want to do that same kind of either either make uh, changes to what you've done or make modifications, but uh, but sometimes just inspire people just to say, hey, I want to I want to do that as well. So uh, the one that's the wonderful thing about the Maker Lab. And so throughout throughout the space, you'll see things you'll see projects going on as well as people displaying their work that they've accomplished in there. So the origins of the Maker Lab, uh, we started out um, in the spring of 2013 with a video uh, that, we, that we did called We Are Makers. And that video is available out on YouTube. Uh, it's been viewed thousands of times uh, outside of ACU, but it was one that we did kind of as we were thinking about the maker movement and how we wanted to proceed in that. We, um, we visited some art, art and design uh, institutes around the country and created this great video uh, that we kind of used that as the springboard to our uh, planning for it. And then in the summer of 2013, we, uh, we decided to move our uh, special collections and archives collection. So we had your traditional uh, books as well as preservation equipment and we were able to move them to a, to a space on a different floor of the library. And that created essentially just a shell that we were able to take that shell and then throughout the uh, fall and rest of the summer, we, were, we moved in um, equipment and uh, furniture and made most of our furniture actually there in the Maker Lab, which was kind of exciting. And then in October 2013, we opened up the um, Maker Lab at our homecoming, had a wonderful homecoming event where we opened up that. And we have visitors uh, not just from ACU, but a lot of visitors from outside of ACU and from the, commu from the Abilene community. So what kind of equipment do we have available? Um, we have, of course, your general shop tools your uh, hammers, drills, and screwdrivers are available, and uh, those are actually available for checkout if students actually want to check those materials out. But a lot of, most of the time, they're wanting to use them just there in the Maker Lab. Uh, one of our popular, more popular items is our fiber art. We have a couple of sewing machines. We have an embroidery machine, uh, ironing boards, cutting mats. Uh, it's amazing what, how many people come in and, they, and they're interested in, uh, in sewing and textiles. So that's something that we've kind of found that's kind of unique to the Maker Lab and our um, work there. Also, we have a laser cutter that's uh, very popular to use. Students come in and they make a lot of projects, not just uh, for classes, but they come in and they want to make Christmas presents for their parents, or uh, or they just want to try out uh, try out the laser cutter uh, for for their um, for their own personal use. And so that's a great thing to do. Uh, 3D printers are real exciting for us. Uh, we've, got, we've got several 3D printers, and I'll talk about that more here in a minute. But, uh, but those have been our, our heavily used equipment. We also have a CNC router that allows people to come in and be able to um, do, um, do cuts and be able to make, um, make some pretty amazing creations out of there. Um, and uh, so that's a very pot. Students come in and they're able to use that. And then metalworking, we got uh, welders, uh, bench grinder, chisels, so things that if students are interested in any of that of uh, metalworking uh, things, we've got some some great uh, tools for them there as well. Um, for, as far as training goes for our uh, people who come into the Maker Lab. We do try to make this Maker Lab mostly a do-it-yourself thing. So we try to do more of a show people once how to do it, and then you know they can come in and uh, and do it themselves after that. And so what we've done is we've created a um, a Canvas uh, a course within our Canvas learning management system that people can come in, that students can come in 
and watch a, watch a brief video, take a quiz, and then they can be, um, and then they, then they actually come in again and a maker person or a staff person will actually show, take them through the equipment um, there uh, side by side. And then students uh, are essentially certified uh, to use that, uh, to use, certified from an ACU perspective to, uh, to come in and use that equipment later on if they want to. Uh, but the main thing I wanted people to get an idea about makerspace is, is that it's really the, the equipment and the tools is not really what defines the, makers, the maker lab for us. It's, um, it's more than just that. It really is the, um, the gathering point. It's the community that, that comes together around making and the expertise and the project ideas that come to us. Um, so I think regardless of, of, what you, of what you can put in there, you can still have a maker space that's really focused on just the idea of making. So what we've done, I, it's really important to point out the mentors and expertise that, we've, that we have in there. So we've uh, created, we've added uh, what we call makers on duty, who are there during the hours that the maker lab is open, and uh, most of them are students who are uh, who are very interested in in the maker lab and um, interested in and uh, in helping others uh, and teaching others about about what's going on in the maker lab. And it's a fantastic group of students as well as uh, staff people on there as well who uh, who train and uh, manage the managed to the makers on duty. As far as some course projects that are happening, I think that's really important to try and tie the maker lab into the curriculum. Uh, one area that's been fantastic is in occupational therapy. They actually offer a course called Intro to Making, where, they, where the uh, main outcome of the course is a 3D printing of prosthetic hands. And so you can see the, some of the outcomes of that here, uh, of that. And we're really, and again, it's a, a very unique course in our occupational therapy program that, uh, that students uh, really come to us from a wide range of backgrounds and, you know, a wide range of knowledge, get knowledge coming into us about making stuff. And then they leave there very excited uh, about, hey, the opportunity to make, to make those um, make those hands and those prosthetic hands, and then it brings them back to other things as they're working on uh, projects and other courses to think about uh, ways that they can uh, make, make objects or tools that can assist, uh, that can potentially assist their patients or, uh, or in their work. Uh, another project that uh, is currently going on right now is we, we offer our, uh, in our honors college, we offer honors colloquiums where uh, professors will come together and uh, teach, teach groups of students. And one of the honors colloquiums that we're offering is on building drones. And we're, uh, one of our uh, professors, Dr. Brent Reeves, is, um, is doing a great job as a partner with us from, uh, in, in, from the uh, information technology area to build a drone out of foam core board. And so this right here is kind of an example of some things we've created. And then he's actually uh, going out and putting the plans online on how to do that. And it's just a great opportunity for students to come in and uh, be able to, uh, to participate in making, in making this and utilizing the Maker Lab tools to do this. Finally, one thing that we're really excited, another thing we're really excited about is our Maker Lab Academies. Uh, we, um, we offer three academies during the summer, uh, with, along, with our, along with the rest of the university summer camps that go on, we offer a Maker Lab Academy uh, for grades four through six, uh, six through eighth, and eight through twelfth. Um, and in those Maker Lab Academies, we give them an introduction to the tools, we show them how show them the show them the equipment and and then ask them to solve problems. So even at our fourth and sixth grade levels, 
uh, we give them even just utilizing paper and glue and, um, and scissors. We teach them how to pro solve problems in the maker lab. And just, just being in that space gives that inspiration to them that, uh, that they really feel like they're doing something and they're, and they're feeling a really great sense of accomplishment and generating a lot of community among themselves. Uh, from the junior high group, you'll see they've gotten a go-kart here, and this is a go-kart that they actually work on building during the week. And then at the end of the week, they race those go-karts. And then the 8th through, through 12th graders are working with robotics. Uh, they're using welding tools and um, lots of great things there. Uh, some of the current challenges we're facing right now, I think, um, I think staffing hours, the Maker Lab is, is limited right now in the amount of staffing that they can do because it is so important to have, to have it staffed um, during the hours. Uh, it's not currently open all the hours that the library is open, but we are trying our best to open. It is open um, at least seven days a week, but uh, we would like to try to increase those hours as much as possible. And then also recently we, we've, uh, we've actually have created a price list for our, Ma our Maker Lab store for students to, uh, who, who want to come in and they can purchase plywood or they can purchase foam board um, and, and other things that they want to use um, for, for their work. And in some cases we have had to charge them for some of the 3D printing that they do. And uh, it's, just, uh, it's just continuing to be a challenge for us as we try to determine what our costs are because we definitely are not a money make. We definitely don't want to be, uh, don't want to char overcharge the students and we, want, and we want the money to go back into the Maker Lab and the work that we do there. But again, it's a challenge of, of what cost points can we, can we work with in this. And then space considerations. We really would like to see this expanded. I know eight, we currently are in a space of about 8,000 square feet, which I know seems like a great, a great amount of square feet and a lot of, um, a lot of space. But I will say that uh, when you get 25 to 30 people in there that are doing work, it can be, um, it can be kind of crowded. And so it would be wonderful to be able to expand that, uh, to expand that space. And we're currently working um, on some plans right now that are not yet funded, but we are working on some plans to try and uh, increase the space of the Maker Lab. And then finally, greater campus involvement. Uh, we've been very fortunate, we feel very blessed by what we have done in, in certain curricular areas with, um, with occupational therapy, with engineering, um, with arts and design, but we really would like to see us uh, increase our campus involvement to, to other areas because I, in our opinion, this crosses all, the Maker Lab crosses all the different disciplines. It crosses business and it crosses even into the arts and humanities. Uh, we feel like there's great opportunities there and we, um, and we want to, uh, we want to really try and reach out to, to the entire community and, and especially build, build the curriculum of the university around the idea of making. And finally, I want to close with a quote from our dean, uh, Dr. Weaver, Dr. John Weaver, who, uh, who kind of cast his vision about the idea of the maker, uh, about the maker lab, as saying that recasting the idea of information literacy as design thinking, with uh, with still having an information seeking and evaluation, but integrating that more into project-based inquiries and uh, and creativity. And so spaces that were once devoted to the shelving of print resources uh, are now dedicated to the hosting of digital tools and data storage, and I would include Maker Lab, of course, in this, uh, for problem-oriented student projects and engaging multiple literacies that, uh, and multiple dimensions of creativity for, uh, for innovative projects like we're doing in the Maker Lab. I, wouldn't, I have to go uh, and thank uh, several people in this uh, who, would make, who are making this Maker Lab possible for us. Dr. Neil Santana, who is a professor of art, of art and design here at ACU, uh, has stepped up to serve as director of our Maker Lab. Uh, we have a Maker Lab coordinator, Darren Wilson, who does a fantastic job of, um, 
of managing um, the space and managing our students, our maker on duties. And then uh, special thanks to Laura Baker, who serves as our librarian liaison to the Maker Lab, and uh, and this is a Maker Lab staff member. Uh, Laura has been with us a long time and served us in, in several different roles, um, but she has really stepped up to be a liaison to our Maker Lab space, and uh, and also serves as a staff member in there as well. So. Uh, it's been exciting to see her growth and development in this. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Mark, and he can uh, discuss the poll questions and hopefully uh, also uh, have Tess present for us. Thank you, Mark. And I will transition this over to Tess right now. And Tess, feel free to go ahead whenever uh, oh. you are ready. Okay. Are you going to move this? Oh, there it is. Okay, fine. Sorry about that. We're under construction, and there was a moment where the electrical went off in the back end of the library. <laughs> so, anyway, um, so um, let me first give a little bit of information about Mercy College. We're a private non-sectarian college in Dobbsbury, New York. So we're in Lower Westchester, right above New York City. We have about 8,100 uh, full-time students. We're an extremely diverse student body. Um, about 70% of our students are first-generation college-goers. Um, so we really believe in that we're offering a transformative educational experience for many students who have never had a lot of academic um, privileges as uh, growing up. So we really do uh, feel very strongly in our mission to make college the best thing possible for our students. Um, that being said, there was a major library renovation in 2009. We received a Title V grant to create a Learning Commons model library. We literally blew out an incredibly old and dark library, um, changing the main room into a large atrium with three-story windows. Um, completing varied student seating, group, solo, pods, we call them, everything with desktops, laptops, wireless was added, and we started housing the tutoring or learning center um, in the back end of the library, so that's one of the things that made it a commons. Um, and this is a picture of it empty, which is never happens except in the summertime, but you can see that it's a, um, a unique space, very bright. The students seem to like it. Um, one of the things we were not anticipating was the growth in our gate count. We went from 11,000 visits in a month in 2009 to right now we're getting between 42 and 45,000 students visits a month. So student space became an incredibly big issue. Um, students were waiting for places to seat, sit, sit on the floor. So we knew we had to do something to uh, uh, change over the physical space of the library. Here is when it's just starting to get busy. This is when, you know, you can see students are literally waiting, standing for, um, for desks and for um, space within the library. So we started a major reorganization of our collection, shifting things electronically as much as possible to journals, serials to electronic. We introduced e-books. Um, we shifted reference to electronic. And any stack area we converted to student use, whether through seating or um, equipment or uh, different um, cubicles or study areas. Um, Last summer, we decided that we'd really like to um, try out some of the high-impact practices that have been um, brought up uh, throughout the campuses, again, to try to engage students in a different level of work. And we purchased a 3D printer and a um, large format poster printer um, to support um, growing undergraduate research projects. And I received a micro grant to introduce 3D printing to faculty and students. We decided not to go with the makerspace model at first because we were trying to embed 3D printing projects within the curriculum. So we were trying to identify classes 
where 3D printing might fit in. So it's, it's, it's slightly different from just starting with a makerspace. We, we were trying to uh, put our tentacles in throughout campus. So for the first year, we were entirely mobile. Um, we had our 3D printer on a cart. It went everywhere. It went to circulation, the library lobby. It visited classrooms. It went to faculty meetings, um, basically introducing the concept of 3D, watching it in action. Uh, we also gave, uh, that gave us some time to uh, create some staff. I'm lucky enough to have um, my two circulation supervisors also have backgrounds and degrees in computer science. Um, they really got into the mechanics of learning 3D, um, how to use 3D modeling software, and as well as how to instruct the students so that it would be part of an engaged um, exchange with the students. And we did lots of demos, displays, um, web events, classroom events, again, um, you know, promoting the idea of 3D printing and what it could do. And here are just some examples of some of the things we printed. Sometimes they were one-off. Sometimes a student or a faculty member would say, as you can see from the skull there, we do have a large OT, um, occupational therapy, physical therapy, health sciences. Um, the removable frog was for a biology class. So we started making more like models for the classes as a way to bring them into the classes. Um, but that very, and here's an example of, you know, these are on the mobile carts, so these can just be moved around, they're bright, and um, so that we can move it throughout the uh, college. Um, but uh, as we got one 3D printer, we found that there were all these other departments on campuses that had gotten grants and gotten 3D printers and had never taken them out of the closet. So we went from one to almost three in a few months, and now we really decided that we needed a space um, to set up um, to be able to work with students in a, in a, in a better um, uh, location. So uh, we decommissioned our DVD collection, um, which was in a uh, small interior room. Uh, we broke through the wall to circulation, so we'd have a pass-through. And um, at this moment, as we're speaking, that room is being converted to, um, to house our 3D printers as well as our poster printer. It's only about 650 square feet, but it's a start. It'll sit um, three to five students working with um, one of our 3D printing specialists. So it's a start, and like I said, we're um, hoping to move forward in building more space. Um, the response to 3D printing, the students love it. It's very engaging. It encourages problem solving, hands-on design, construction. Um, it allows for experimentation and creativity. So it's very different from you know, writing a paper or giving a presentation. And we found that the more we promoted it to faculty members, they are now including it, um, 3D projects in many of our classes, biology, occupational therapy, physics, and many more, so that it's, it's really more of a classroom-driven curriculum material session right now. Um, we don't have it open to students in general. Uh, but if students are interested, obviously we will show them, but it's really more class by class. So it's, it's, it's not open to the entire community yet, but we hope to get there at some point. Um, and, and like I said, um, you know, the more space, the more we'll make use of it. So that being said, I will hand it back to Mark. Great. Thank you, Tess. Okay. So let the me, here there we go. All right, so we have uh, the opportunity for folks to send in questions through the chat box. And it looks like we have a few questions already coming in. Um, Janice has asked um, to Mark, how do you deal with ventilation um, in this, this maker space and in this 3D printing space? Uh, we're still kind of learning a little bit about that. I will say my office is just right on the other side of the Maker Lab, and I get all kinds of interesting fumes coming through there every once in a while. But uh, fortunately, uh, we do have, it is kind of at the, you know, 
in a corner of the building that leads out to the, the that leads outside. So we do have some ventilation in there, and um, and we've been fortunate to that um, that we have we have had we have had some. It was, it's not a space that was poorly ventilated at first. Great, thank you, thank you for that. Um, and I think we've got an, another question here asking: Is the ACU Maker Lab outside of the library? Uh, no, it's it is inside the library. It's uh, we've it's part of a uh, part of a part of an addition that was added on back in '84. And so we've uh, added, so it is part of, is, is uh, reclamated space from, uh, from that, from an addition that was, that was added back then. Okay, all right. Um, and we have another question, I think, for, for both uh, Mark and Tess from Danelle that says, how is anyone handling maintenance and repair of the equipment? Could you talk about that a little bit in both of your spaces? Um, we often have um, the biggest maintenance is with a 3D printer is actually the extruder heads where you know where the plastic actually you know starts coming out. Um, we have found that um, we we have bought multiple um, extruder heads and we've bought different types to deal with different kind of plastics, um, but they they're pretty easy to keep. Um, to keep um, cleaned. Um, the machines are pretty much, you know, um, they're actually a lot less complicated than we thought they were going to be. They don't need a lot of uh, tuning or anything like that. So once they're properly set up the first time, they're pretty indestructible. But the biggest problem we've had is extruder heads and um, the quality of the plastics. It, you have to be careful with um, buying um, good quality plastic that's not going to Cause um, lots of you know clogs and 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 poor uh, poorly designed um, uh, models because the plastic is just not you know the best quality. Thank you, thank you. And and do you find Mark that you have similar issues or are your issues different? Um, no, our issues are the same as what Tess is talking about. Um, they really uh, they really are. Um, Fairly indestructible, and uh, fortunately, we've ha we've got some staff. Our staff people are, are very knowledgeable in that, and they've uh, they've been able to figure it out. In fact, uh, in fact, we've actually uh, built our own 3D printers from kits that we've purchased. Wow, that's that's very cool. cool. Um, we've got another question here from Elizabeth uh, that says, "Was there resistance to changing how the library spaces were used?" For example, fac faculty on our campus are upset that collaborative and maker spaces are replacing the stacks. If so, how did you deal with that resistance? Well, well, I can speak to that. When I came on board, I was called the librarian who feeded books. So um, I deaccessioned 70,000 books in a single year, but they were mostly books that were not being used. And you know, um, it takes a lot of time to change over faculty, especially faculty opinion. Um, at first, they hated electronic journals. Um, two to three years later, it's like they've always been there. So I think if you've got a strong story to tell and you just show how easy they are to use. And the thing that I think really won our faculty over was the inc incredible increase in student usage of the library, not just of the physical library, but um, all of our databases, the journals themselves, the ebooks. We had ebooks that went from, um, that tripled in usage in three years. So, um, so that, that, those kind of facts really help um, assuage people's um, problems with uh, what's happening to the library, you know. Um, so I think if you just have a good story to tell and constantly tell the story, um, it really does help. But um, yeah, people are going to be resistant, but that doesn't mean you still shouldn't go forward. But it, it helps to have a, you know, a bunch of uh, stats in your pocket. Wow, that's that's very interesting. And and did you have a, a similar experience, Mark, or or was was that different? 
No, I, I, I totally agree with Tess. I think we yeah uh, we we have had a similar experience in that you do have to have that story to tell and you know our, our story began in 2005 with the creation of our learning commons and to see the the growth that happened there we really developed a, almost a strong trust from the faculty to know that you know y'all what y'all have done here is is great and we and we trust you but what y'all are doing is 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 continuing to move us forward. And so um, and so it, that's been great. And we were fortunate we didn't we didn't actually we didn't actually weed out any collections uh, with as I said before with our special collections and archives that we moved and we actually found a, a larger space and a better space space on a, in a, on a different floor of the library that we were able to move them to. And uh, we did move out our periodicals office. But, and so as we're moving, but most of our faculty are pretty, um, pretty supportive of the fact that they see us moving to electronic journals and electronic books. And, uh, and so as I said before, they could kind of develop a trust in us that we, that we know a good, a good path forward. Great, yeah, that, that's very interesting. Um, another question that we have is, from, from Shane is, do you have any competition from private maker spaces or DIY, do-it-yourself um, sorts of spaces in your area, or is, is the library really the only game in town around that? Well, I can't answer that. There are very few maker spaces in Westchester right now. Um, there are a number of college campuses that have very large maker spaces. Um, but um, but we're not so much a makerspace right now. It's really um, we are supporting um, maker projects within the classroom. So we don't just print things when people come in. Um, so we're not really open in that way. But like I said, I, I would like to see us move into more that any student could come in and, and more like the ACU model and try all this equipment out. But we're not there yet. Thing. And, and do you, is that also true, Mark, for you that there, there really um, that there isn't a whole lot of competition from outside <laughs> for for uh, students' time in in the makerspace and that sort of thing? I think if you're talking, Mark, you may be on mute. I'm sorry, I'm here. I apologize for that. <laughs> no problem. Just uh, also wondering if you have the same experience, um, or or we could move on to, to talking about um, resources um, for makers. Uh, Janice has mentioned that Instructables is, is uh, a good resource for makers. What are some of the, the other resources or similar resources that you're using? Um, in, in your libraries? I'm sorry, as far as Instructables go? Instructables or, or other resources? Um, what, what, what are the resources um, along those lines that you're using? Do you use Instructables at all in the library? Um, we do some, we, we pretty much have, um, have used uh, have used some instructables in that it's for for our, for training. I'm I'm guessing I'm I'm, a summer, I'm so sorry. Um, for for training, is that what the is that, I'm sorry? Is that the question? Yeah, I believe so. In, in training folks how to how yeah. use the space and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yes. So uh, so yes, we we have used instructables. We also our educational technology um, staff. Also have uh, have really stepped up, and as I said, for from our from our Canvas learning management system, we are able to uh, to add to uh, have courses and modules that we use for that as the, the students can access. Yeah, we also use a lot of videos that are on our TechZone site on our website. 
Um, and, um, you know, the other thing, believe it or not, that we found was very useful, we buy lots of um, software books for us, the different 3D modeling programs um, so that even though the students can download, um, there are quite a number of 3D modeling programs that are available for free, like Tinkercad. Um, it helps to have, we found, what we did when we were working with student groups is if we had 10 copies of a small manual with a lot of uh, question and answers and diagrams and all that kind of stuff that it really helped the group projects so that we we bought, um, one of the things I did with the micro grant was I bought a lot of, you know, uh, packs of different uh, software books so students could actually work together on them so that they could, learn, you know, teach themselves the software and how to tweak their designs, um, which has been very useful. Um, and I think a lot of it is sometimes just uh, we've used a lot of the, um, the the material that's available on the web, like Thingiverse, and um, NASA has an incredible 3D modeling site, and the CDC and the National Institute of Health, um, so that letting students look at models has been, I think, is 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 sometimes the best way to have them start a pro, you know, solve problem, you know, solving a problem, so they could find something similar and then tweak that particular model, so they wouldn't have to start it from the ground up. So I think that's been very useful because that is a learning. It's a it's it's quite a learning curve to learn some of the 3D modeling um, software design programs. Yeah, and then also, and then also, we have a pretty active um, Maker Lab blog, and there mm -hmm. are, and there we try to uh, post projects pretty regularly, as well as kind of the, the instruct, as kind of instructing people with that, including uh, designs and uh, blueprints. Great, great. Um, we've just got a, a couple of minutes left. It looks like um, we have. Uh, Another question here um, about liability. Do you, is, is there any kind of li liability issue that the library faces um, with integrating these sorts of spaces into into it? The only liability that ever comes up is everyone says, "What if they somebody prints a gun, a, um, a 3D printed plastic gun?" Um, and that's only because that's been in the news. Um, so um, it's it's often more um, it's what someone has read um, in a newspaper about you know the what people can do in a 3D printer, you know, but um, I don't think, I think it's more, um, I don't have any of the, the laser cutters or lathes, I would think, but that's the same as any kind of lab situation. You have to just make sure your students are safety certified before they um, start working in a lab. Um, but I think a lot of that has been, um, it, it, it's, there was just a lot of noise about it at first, but I think it, it's, it's pretty simple to, to get it started and we've had no problems with facilities or, or any college administration in, in creating a lab. Yeah, I would say for us as well, we do, um, as, when students come in, we do have them sign, sign, a, sign an agreement and waiver. And uh, also, um, we have our we have a good relationship with our risk management team here on campus, and um, and so we and so we do try we try to do everything we can for safety for for safety. We keep we have a sink for in case in case we have any accidents, um, and we've got we try to keep a lot of cleaning supplies on hand. So um, so we try our best to. Eight risk to wherever we can. That, that makes sense. That's, we've got uh, one last question that, that I'll put out there. Um, and Kaya asks, when you downsized your print collection, did you also downsize the staff who managed the print collection, or did you transition them, or, or what, what was the strategy there? 
We've totally, yeah, I was going to say, I can, I can speak to that. We've really transitioned our staff. Um, we went from, um, we had four full-time catalogers. We went down to one. Um, we moved one to interlibrary loan, another to circulation, and another one into graphics and um, uh, monitor support. In other words, so we basically, um, we did not cut staff. Uh, we transitioned staff into um, jobs that we needed filled. So, um, so we didn't lose any staff in this transition. We actually just reconfigured, especially um, the, our, our professional staff, not so much our librarians, but our, our you know, um, all, all of our other folks. We've, we've literally uh, probably rewritten almost every job here in the last five years. We've done the same thing here for, our, for us as well. We've tra we have really worked hard to transition staff and, um, and kind of tried to, try to encourage them to, for growth and development. And, um, and so in, in some ways, it has transformed us from, um, from, our, from our previous work that we've been doing. And so like as Tess said, it's, it's been a trans, definitely been a transformative process for us and uh, working up new job descriptions and new job titles. Um, but uh, but it's been, but we've got a lot. Of, but the staff have been very very supportive and and um, just done a great job of of working with us. Great. Well, well, it looks like we're about out of time now. So I just want to say thank you to to Mark and to Tess and to Gina for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, I'd like to give all of you a virtual round of applause. Uh, thanks again for spending time with us um, and uh, for, for all this really interesting inf information. Um, we appreciate it very much. Thank I would you. Also remind, I would also remind participants that we have recorded today's program. Um, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL in Choice, and that email will include instructions on how to access the archived version. Uh, again, thank you to all of you folks in the audience for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the session, and I hope you have an excellent day.